Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome on the Culture News. My name is David Cerrero, and I have the pleasure today on iHeartRadio to welcome, um, it's very hard to describe her. She is one of my favorite artists of all time. She is one of the best pianists. To me, she is the best pianist. But I would say she is one of the greatest pianists of all time. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? She is French. She is the pride and joy of France. So in France, we have great pastries. We thank God every day for giving us beautiful architecture. But also, we thank God for giving us our wonderful guest of the day. Her name, of course, you recognize her. Her name is Ellen Grimo. She is absolutely divine. She has released a new album. She's touring the whole world. And we are so lucky to have her today over the phone right before rehearsal shows. She's doing so much. We are so happy to have her right over the phone, the lovely Ellen Grimo. Ellen, how are you today? I'm very well. Thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you to you. Thank you to you. First of all, where is your French accent? Because you you sound so perfect uh, American, you know. <laughs> well, I've lived in the U.S. for a long time now, but um, but people always guess that I come from France. There is no hiding it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's per- perhaps your your natural je ne sais quoi, you know, that uh, uh, people love, lo- love so much. So um, I would love to know things that we cannot find on Google, can you tell us what do you remember from your childhood that made you start to become a, perhaps not a pianist, but to start at least to be attracted by this beautiful instrument, the piano? I think I really owe it all to my parents. Um, it was nowhere on my radar because music wasn't a part of their lives. Um, my mother sang a lot always at home. She had a very melodious voice, um, a very good ear, excellent pitch, loved to recite poetry, which of course has music within it. Um, that was probably my very first exposure um, to music in its in its original form, if you will, the music of the language, and then her singing. Um, and then from there, I was just really lucky that they identified somehow a need for an extracurricular activity. I had a lot of um, energy in school, was in a way always well channeled. It got in the way um, more than anything. And um, the first assumption was that it was a surplus of physical energy. So the first um, activities that were offered to me were you know, sports, dance. I was stiff as a broom. I had no interest in anything of the sort. And one of the last things was um, almost by chance was piano um and so my father brought me into this basic um, music course for very young children um there was a bunch of kids in a big room an upright piano a set of drums and and an ad that was teaching the basics and uh, by the time my father picked me up after that first 45 minutes she came over to him and said i think she is gifted for music i think you should have her start the piano it's a good instrument to begin with she can always switch later but that's what I recommend. And the course was very, very basic. She would, um, you know, play a tune on the piano, have the kids hit the drums to detect if they had a, you know, sense of rhythm. Uh, She would have them sing along. And so it was really more music initiation course, if you will. And then it went from there. And so I'm so lucky that, that, you know, this opportunity um, was given to me. It oh, captivated wow. my know, attention. That, mm-hmm. that I think that that's really what what did the trick, really, because it changed my life in the sense that that it it didn't only um, capture my 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 attention, but it captivated my imagination. And from that moment, um, it was clear that whatever surplus energy was there was more mental than anything else, and music channeled it. So, the sort of redemption. Wow, it's so beautiful, uh, and of course, we're so grateful to your parents. And uh, all the wonderful oh, teachers, you know, who recommended you. Uh, I just don't see you behind the guitar or behind the flute. You know what I mean? You have 
this charisma that you need, not that, uh, of course, uh, the flutists uh, don't have charisma, that's not what I meant, but I mean, you are embodying this instrument so well. And I didn't know, you know, about uh, uh, your, your mom being a singer, because it's funny, every time I listen to you, whether you play Chopin or you play Brahms or you play any of these big guys, I always feel that your piano sings. You know, like I don't hear uh, different notes. I hear one note. It's a little bit like Duke Ellington when he mm -hmm. said that uh, the orchestra is the one instrument. You know what I mean? So um, I, I'm feeling this um, uh, with you. If you were not Ellen Grimo, if you were not Ellen Grimo, how would you, I would say, qualify? Because I'm sure you heard so many pianists. You worked with Daniel Barenboim to start with. But you, you work with so many, I'm sure you heard and you study and you analyze many, many great pianists. I'm sure you can judge many pianists. If you were not Alan Grimo, how would you qualify your style? What is the signature of Alan Grimo from her own words? Oh, that's a tricky question. Um, <laughs> not a trick question, just a tricky question to answer. Um, well, I would say perhaps the fact that, um, if nothing else, I think the playing is, it's generous, it's honest, and it's emotional. Um, does not mean it doesn't have many shortcomings, but, um, but when I'm out there, I give everything I have in the moment. And for me, the concert has to be an emotional journey. If it isn't that, then you don't really need it. You can stay home and listen to your favorite recording. So, wow. and what you said that earlier is, so is, a, is a great compliment, but it's also the greatest challenge to make the, the piano sing, because at the end of the day, it's just a percussive instrument. And, you know, it has no natural sustain. And so that is always the défi, you know, if you will, as we say in French, this, this, uh, this challenge of making yeah. that sound um, take on so many different uh, incarnations, but but the goal is always for it to come as close to as close as possible to the human voice, um, because I, I think at the end of the day the playing has to suggest something else. It has to be inhabited by something. It's not just about the notes, um, and it's even beyond what is between the notes. Oh, oh my goodness! Between the notes. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, I just have to digest what you just said. That is something that I never heard. I mean, I heard Miles Davis talking about, uh, you know, using the silence and all of that, but I never heard someone saying there is also what is between the notes. That is so genius. That is so genius. Um, you know, we have that image um, of, you know, classical pianists who, uh, play only classical music. They do nothing else. They 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 wake up. They listen only to classical music. I still, you know, believe that uh, classical pianists they also need sometimes to uh, wash their ears also and entertain their ears. Is there any music that you? I know we're very you're very close to the nature. We're going to talk about that. But uh, what kind of other music do you like to play? Do you like jazz? I know you like Ravel Debussy, which you know there's some of it in there. Um, yes. Is there any um, genre of music that you like to to listen or to dance on, or you like to play? I like jazz very much. I like some rap, um, probably because of the the rhythmical element. I've always liked Eminem. I like Michael Jackson. I like Radiohead. A lot of other groups. Oh, yeah. some, a lot of electronic musicians as well for the atmosphere that they create through a rather minimalistic soundscape. So yeah, many many different things, um, and that's you know that's what makes it so so interesting. Music has so many different um, languages, you know, within its own planet, um, and it's it's always an enrichment to be exposed to different different styles, um, different ways of suggesting another world. So uh, it's an important part of my life. One thing I have difficulty with is having music in the background. So usually when I listen to music, no matter what style, not only classical, it pretty yeah. much takes precedence. I have to drop whatever I'm I'm doing. I can't mm. really do it um by by default. So that 
it's, that's maybe the only thing that uh, that makes it a little less what, flexible. Wow. Well, you know, you, I love what you're saying, you know, so I couldn't agree more with everything you're saying. So you have recorded uh, a lot of beautiful material. You played almost every uh, composers and on your most latest recording, you have recorded a beautiful album called The Messenger on Dutch Gramophone. We say hello to our friends on Dutch Gramophone with whom you are um, an exclusive artist, I believe, since 2002, if I re- 2006 maybe. Uh, and then you have created an intriguing dialogue between Mozart and Sylvester Strauss. Uh, can you tell us how that album, uh, I would say, came about? Well, I think The Messenger is really an, an echo to the Credo album, my first recording for Deutsche Gramophone, but also to um, reflection, resonances, um, even water, in the sense that I've always liked, and actually I started um, my second recording for Den on Nippon Columbia um, way back when. I think I was 16 by the time I made that second recording, or 17, where I started to bring different pieces from different composers, and I always felt that they shed a light onto one another, which which makes the creation of the program a thing in itself. Um, and perhaps instead of hearing them in a context that would be more familiar, for example, with next to other pieces by that same composer or within one given cycle, but it is interesting to have these correspondences um, and to juxtapose them in ways which might be insolite, as we say in French, um, perhaps unexpected. Yeah. But at the end, when you listen to the whole, it creates it creates a story, whether it's through the tonality or through yeah. the emotional content. So in the case of The Messenger with Mozart and Silvestrov, both composers, um, in my humble opinion, are musics that speak of, of, I think, more more paradise lost than paradise found. And um, there is a very strong mystical presence to to both of these, not only composers, but these pieces, which I specifically chose. Um, the D minor concerto, the two fantasies mm. on D minor, C minor by Mozart, which are his two most rhapsodic um, pieces by nature, actually. But um, And then the D minor concerto, which is perhaps the most Beethovenian, if one can say that. Um, this this sense of, of um, this, you know, imminent... Um, Entry of destiny, yeah. this 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 meeting with 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 fate. Um, it's very highly dramatic tonality for Mozart, one he didn't use very often, and I, I feel it has a very personal uh, significance within his work. Um, and the Silvestrov um, world, which I was introduced to by Manfred Ascher, the um, um, director of the ECM label years and years ago, actually, through this uh, wonderful song cycle, Stille Lieder, Silent Songs, um, and I fell in love with that music right there and then, a decade and a half ago at least, if not a little more, and then started to play quite a few of his pieces. So uh, this is also logical in that sense, but I feel that they create a, a very special world next to each other. Yeah, and we see it also. We we can hear. Maybe you're gonna think yeah, I'm uh, I'm uh, crazy, but I w- we really feel the dialogue um, between these two. I would say uh, universes of uh, Mozart and uh, Silver Strobe. So really, uh, c- congratulations. It's it's really uh, beautiful. Uh, if you would have a lunch with or dinner with Mozart, what would you tell him? What would you like to know from him? I probably would simply like to be in his presence and mostly be quiet. But that's the thing, you know, we often fantasize about the chance of of having a conversation with our favorite composers because they are, you know, they are partners, just like the instrument, um, the piano, which is, well, in my case, probably my steadiest partner throughout my life. And some of these composers are as well because they've been friends since childhood. At the same time, I always go back to the conclusion that um, 
the best of what they have to give us is in their music, really, in their art. And as much as I would be fascinated to be able to find out more about the man, the human being, um, behind the artist, I think, well, what more to ask for than the emotional con- 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 content that they give us through their through their pieces and how far that takes us. Um, you know, it's the case, well, with, with all of these composers, I believe that, you know, music creates a bridge towards the a spiritual world, a world which is yeah. um, beyond the one in which we, you know, we um, evolve throughout our lifetime. And, um, and that's the greatest, the greatest gift. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm always thinking, do these guys like Mozart, Beethoven would even think that, you know, like 400 years, 300 years, 200 years later, people are still, you know, writing books about them, still learning them. And they are such an international language because I've been to Morocco and I've seen, you know, kids learning Mozart, you know, it's, it's so so um, incredible that we, we owe so much, but we owe to you, Ellen, because not only you bringing your beautiful playing, but also you are doing these beautiful actions. We're so grateful to you because in 1999, you founded the Wolf Conservation Center, the WCC in South Salem. So uh, I think you made worldwide renowned the city of South Salem because I don't think anybody else uh outside of new york we know that city but with all due respect but no you made that city worldwide famous because uh first of all you talk um about it in your book it's part of the title of uh, of your book um you're very close of course to uh the wolves can you tell us um i, I was going to ask a very naive question uh, but why the wolves and not uh another animal or what do you find in the wolves that really uh, fascinates you besides, of course, their beautiful hair and uh, the beautiful eyes? Well, what got me interested in the cause um, initially was actually the discrepancy um, that existed and to some degree still unfortunately exists and persists to this day, the discrepancy between what people perceive of them and what they truly are. Um, and that was the reason for for founding the Wolf Conservation Center, um, really as a as a not for profit environmental education organization, and the goal of which is to work to protect and preserve wolves in North America, and and that is best accomplished through science based education. Very important because so many of the decisions made today are unfortunately not based in science. Um, but also advocacy and and participation in the federal recovery and release programs for two of the most critically endangered wolf species, the Mexican gray, gray wolf and the red wolf. And so that was for me um, the goal. You know, the wolf is a it's an umbrella species, a keystone species, um, a top predator. When you work to save the wolf, you cannot do that without saving its natural habitat and therefore benefiting all of the species um, which live in that env- environment. It is the top predator of most of northern ecosystems and it is very um, important for the balance of, of nature. We call wolves engineers of biodiversity and um, and to preserve as healthy and, and wholesome an environment as possible is a, res- is a responsibility we have not only for us but for um, you know, generations to come. And I believe that not only our physical health depends on it, but also our our um, psychological, emotional, and spiritual health as well. Well, we, we are so grateful to you for uh, doing this. And, and I hope uh, uh, I'd be able someday to, to visit South Salem and visit all I the great you- things you do and, and, and bring, yeah, and bring awareness on um, on all the the great things you're doing, you are so generous with us with your time. I don't want to take uh, too much. I want to thank from the bottom of my heart, uh, Mr. Max Horowitz from uh, Crossover Media for putting this together, and most importantly, the amazing, the lovely Ellen Grimo. Ellen, I don't know what to tell you. You are simply phenomenal. You are so inspiring. 
I read, of course, your, your books. I listen to all your stuff. Every time there is a new video of you on YouTube, I run to, <laughs> to no. watch it and, and, and <laughs> to do what you do. Um, just tell me the truth. Um, how many fingers do you really have? <laughs> well, I can confirm um, that I only have 10, unfortunately, even though I ten, know uh, yeah, yeah. very often that there would be a few more of those going around. But... <laughs> <laughs> so because but I, what can I, I say? You... you always have to yeah. compensate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I feel that there were like another 10 or 20 more fingers, but... No, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, no. It, it, you are you don't come from this planet, uh, Ellen. It's a nice no. try to tell us you were born in France, but <laughs> you're coming from another planet. Uh, we, we we have to uh, admit that. Of course, I'm only kidding. Uh, the lovely ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Sarira. I had the pleasure today on iHeartRadio and many other platforms. We are so excited, so honored. Listen to all her album. Purchase all her album. Uh, make a donation to that Wolf Conservation Center. Go to run to see her performing. She's in Seattle, uh, sorry, in Houston. Then after she goes to Seattle, she goes to Naples in Florida. Lucky you in December. You're going to enjoy yourself over there. And um, you're going to have uh, a great time. You go on her website, ellengrimo.com. You can see uh, more of her bio, all her agenda. And of course, you can purchase her wonderful music and follow up on the Wolf Conservation Center. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so happy. Ellen, I adore you, madam. I adore you. Thank you, thank you. Merci, merci, merci. Thank you so much for your generosity. It will accompany me Do, in times of doubt. Now, can you say a, a little phrase in French for, uh, for the people of France? Because right now I'm in Paris, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up a little bit to the people. I'm going to say, guess with who I spoke today. I spoke with Ellen Grimo. No one is going to believe me. Can you say a little thing in French, like, uh, you know, I don't know, something? <laughs> Mais je peux vous dire, je peux vous dire que vous me manquez. Ça fait bien trop longtemps et je me réjouis de revenir à Paris fin janvier, début février, en, encore une fois, fin mars. En tout cas, je vous aime, vous êtes irrévérent, je vous admire et vous êtes mon pays. Merci. To all of that for me? All of that for me? <laughs> No, of course, you were not talking of me. You were talking well, of the French people because they say, I miss you. I thought, me? You know? <laughs> no, you know, no, we, of course. People think that I left France um, as a rejection, not at all. There was no element of oh, rejection. Oh, never. No, 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 no. I, I just, no one, no, no one thinks that, quest, I assure you. Search, it was a search for something else, simply. Of course. Of course. And uh, and uh, listen, you're, you're French in your heart. You're French in your fingers. You are taking... <laughs> the beautiful French school of piano that in those days when teachers were giving all their heart and soul, it was not about money, it was not about getting private lessons, it was uh, putting everything into their students. So you are honoring all of that and you are in the hearts of all the French uh, uh, people. And, uh, you know, uh, you have many venues in, in France. They also, you know, they can invite you more often, you know. <laughs> so th this is, uh, I want you to know that at least this show is your home. You can come back anytime. You see, when you have a French Moroccan over the phone, the ending of the interview is longer than the whole interview, right? The goodbye I love it. is longer That's than the, the whole interview. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way. <laughs> well, God bless you, my dear. Have a lovely you day. Like more music. You know what? We're going to play some of the Ellen Grimo. You know what? We're going to do uh, next week. I'm going to do an Ellen Grimo day. Throughout the whole day, we're going to play only Ellen Grimo um, uh, music. Let's do that. We're going to do that. Oh, my God. I love that woman. She's simply amazing. What a lovely baby. You guys are so lucky. Whoever can go and see her right now. More music. We're going to play some of that beautiful new record of the lovely Ellen Grimo, our dear, dear friend. More music to follow up. Stay tuned with us. <laughs> 